your <laughs> presentation. <laughs> Very nice to meet you again. Sorry, I'm looking forward yeah, to Yeah, thank you. I can't leave, I can't stay until the end. I have another meeting, but sorry. Okay, no but, problem. But really lovely to see you. <laughs> so I think the meeting recording has started. So I will. So uh, welcome everyone to Imaging One World. Today we have John Bhapti Sabri Day, and it's a great pleasure to have him. Uh, John is a physicist by training and has contributed immensely to microscopy and image analysis. I think he was 12 years at Institute Curie and then uh, since 2009, he's leading a, a research and development team at Bordeaux. So I'm not going to tell all great things he has done for microscopy, but nonetheless, recently he moved to Singapore and where he started developing single objective light sheet microscope, I believe, which he might talk today. In addition to several other things, the main awards he got is the CNRS Crystal Medal in 2006, and then recently chair the excellence regional council of equitine in 2009 if i got it right so yes so i don't know how to pronounce it and how important that award was but yeah john Wop, this uh, really lo looking forward to your talk yeah thanks for coming yeah thanks a lot thanks very much for the kind introduction so let me share my screen and tell me if it works fine if i share the good one so do you see my screen yeah perfect good. So thanks for the introduction. Thanks very much uh, so for giving me the opportunity to talk today and present what we are doing in my group in, um, in Bordeaux at the Interdisciplinary Institute for Neuroscience, where I'm here for a bit more than 10 years now already. So today we'll uh, talk about our ongoing work, trying to bridge the dimensions between the single cell, let's say nanoscopic uh, level, up to like uh, something pretty new in our hands uh, because we spent many, many years doing super resolutions, which means like isolated cells to, to get the, the best of what we can do at the single molecule level. But now we're, we have switched for many years, uh, thanks to a collaboration we have with the group of Virgil Vyasnov in, the, in Singapore to work on 3D uh, cell culture. And the way, the reason why we move to this direction is, as I will show you, is really technology driven. And with this common technology that we have developed already like more than five years uh, ago, which is called the source beam for single objective light sheet microscope. Okay, so what is technique uh, is about? So the, the source beam is a very simple concept where you know this traditional light sheet microscope that usually require two objectives, one to create a light sheet and one to collect the fluorescence. Uh, the, the, the source beam relies on a very simple concept, which uh, rely on having this very little micro, 45 degree micro mirror attached to the cover slip at the proximity of your biological samples, which allow you from the single objective of your microscope to first create the light sheet by reflecting the beam onto this 45 degree mirror and then collecting the light back to the same objective. So what is uh, interest uh, about the, this technique? So if you now just compare, so to the uh, whole advantage that which I think we all know about this, uh, uh, the light sheet microscopy and how it benefits from having like very good sectioning, very good penetration depth, high speed of, uh, of imaging and very gentle to the living and photo bleaching because typically what you excite is more or less exactly what you get compared to the AP uh, illumination case, even confocal, which you of course uh, 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 illuminate more than you, than you collect. However, it has uh, limited uh, the abilities which are mainly due to the fact that we are using more than one objective, which put like a strong physical constraint around the sample. And actually one of the limit is that of course, having two, uh, at least one high numerical aperture objective is a bit complex. Uh, so the resolution can be limited. And there is another uh, important manipulation um, limit is the sample manipulation. So the access to, to, to the object, to the biological object is a bit complicated. And of course the throughput also is, is kind of limited. 
So now put in parallel uh, the source beam uh, advantage. So by having this little uh, micrometer here, you don't need a single objective. And of course, everything turns to red, uh, to from red to green. So now we can use a numerical patch objective. We have the full access to the sample. And of course, the, the throughput can be now uh, augmented. I will uh, show you that. But there is now a new limit that we need to consider is the use of this microfabric device, which is, of course, something uh, that is as a, as, a, as a constraint. But I will show you how we have used this. Uh, we can turn these, these devices also as another advantage for uh, to improve some, uh, some of the parameters of the acquisition. Okay, so one of the main advantage of the, the technique is that is versatility. You can really go for to like much more complex uh, sample like uh, whole embryo. It's just idea just to scale with the the micro well that we the size of the micro well that we use to host your sample at the proximity of the forty five degree mirror. Okay, so here in this case, if you have like a little uh, a micro well of a couple of tens of micrometer that can host a cell or a couple, uh, or a, or a couple of uh, cells, small cell aggregates. Okay, then you will be able to do single cell imaging and then you can go bigger and bigger. And this is a few illustration of what we've been collected over the years, different collaboration, different application, proof of concept, or you can see that we can do uh, 3D live and fixed imaging at the single cell level, which is something not straightforward for uh, light microscopy, showing that it is very gentle to uh, to living sample with this uh, T lymphocyte. We can image for a long time. We can look at small uh, cell aggregates, but also as I introduced before, this new uh, at least in our hands uh, 3D cell culture, which are the perfect also one another perfect object for a technology. We can also image bigger organisms even through. I would not say that it's the best application for uh, for uh, our technology. <clears throat> okay, so big advantage of the of the technique is that now that is very. It comes with the very simple uh, instruments. So you have like a classical inverted microscope, the source beam unit, the beam steering unit, you just put on the back port of your microscope, it contains a few optic, I will talk about later. Then we implement uh, all the, the, the software for triggering the, the, uh, the, the, the light sheets uh, with, the, with the camera that we plug into the, the commercial software, Metamorph. And then we have these micro devices, which come now with di okay, di different size and uh, different types. But here, the more classical now is the, the Petri dish that you can see a bit of the coating here, the gold coating where uh, you have these micro wells and then the, that uh, are used to reflect the beam. So I think in general, if just like give a bit of summary of something uh, of the interesting feature here is that the Find that it is compatible with an inverting microscope is something very make things very easy. The access to the sample is really simplified, so there is no more complicated than any other microscope. And also, you can not only do it's not like dedicated to uh, to the source beam. You can also like combine with bright field first and or of course the source beam, which can we are like several configuration where you can also have a spinning disk attached to it. You can share the lasers. You can do single molecule location microscopy as well. That's just what I will show you and so on and so forth. So it's really not a dedicated system. It's really like an additional modality to your microscope. Okay, so just to have a little close look to the beam steering unit. So it's very simple inside, just a couple of scanners here to be able to vehicle the light into the good position on the mirror and to be able to create the, the light sheets. And then we have two simple elements. So one is, a, is a, um, adjustable light to adjust the light sheet position here. Okay, so we have a tunable lens, which allow you to position the, the, the beam, so which is the sharpest uh, uh, place of the beam to the area of interest of your sample here. And then we have here a, a little uh, iris, a little diaphragm to allow you to tune the property of your light sheet, whether you want it to have like a very 
Tiny lychee. This is a Gaussian uh, beam uh, elimination. So it, of course, I always have a trade-off between thickness and length. So whether you want to have like a very small light sheet, typically if you want to do super resolution, single cell imaging or a couple of cells. And of course, if you now want to look at bigger uh, object, uh, bigger samples, you change the objective, then you change the properties of your light sheet and then you can have like a much longer light sheet, which will be thicker uh, as well. Then we have the software. So we developed the whole software package, which is acts as a plugin to the metamorph and then allow you to synchronize very precisely the position of the light sheet along the mirror. So just translating the lighting along the mirror allow you to change the focal place and then we synchronize also the, the, the objective so that the excitation plane will be exactly, of course, aligned uh, uh, with your imaging plane, which is very important, of course. And we have the little electronic that does that does the job, and we synchronize that with the uh, with the camera acquisition. We at with frequencies we can reach like up to uh, to uh, hundred kilohertz, so much faster than the, the acquisition itself. Okay, so first application I want to talk, which was to say the truth, our first ID uh, to you to combine this, the source beam to do super resolution because this is our, our field of expertise for years in the team. So I will not spend too much time, but I think you kind of all aware about how this uh, single molecule location microscopy works. So it is just the fact that uh, with traditional first microscopy, we are limited by diffraction, meaning that if you shine all your molecule in, the, in uh, at once, what you will see is the convolution between your point spread function, okay, which is limited in size, with the object uh, of interest. So you will do this convolution, and the result will be a blurry version of your uh, original object. Resolution is limited to about half of the wavelengths in general at the best, which is about, let's say 250 lateral, 500 uh, axial, which at the end, if you put that in the, what the, the scales, which we are interested in, in biology prevent to, uh, to, to look below the, 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 some complex, which be like micromolecular complex in the range of few tens of uh, nanometer, uh, nanometers up to hundred nanometer will not be able to, to be resolved. Single molecular equation microscopy comes with the fact that we are able, and we knew before this, uh, to localize if there is a single molecule because we know the signature, which is the point spread function, we can localize it with a precision, which is of course much better than the resolution. We'll come to that later. And this great idea and simple idea of super resolution was we need to be able to not synchronize all the fluorescent at the same time, but to kind of uh, use the time, you know, to to uh, to be able to to uh, to have your fluorescent spread over time, so that you have only a very sparse number of molecules which are fluorescent, while most of the other molecules are non-fluorescent. By doing this and finding the good single molecule regime, you are for each frame that you collect, able to have single molecule, which you can localize with an accuracy, which can be tenfold better in the resolution uh, of, the, of the microscopy and see how you improve by accumulating the acquisition over time, accumulating the localization, then you are capable to reconstruct an object with a resolution which has been improved. Single molecule, we're not really talking about resolution because it's, it's a bit different. Now we're talking, we have localization, we have the position of fluor four, we reconstruct the image, and then we're more talking about accuracy of localizing each individual fluor four. And what is important with them going into the detail is that it scales with the, of course, the point spread function of your microscope initially. So you need, and then, but also the number of photons that you can collect above the background, which are really the parameter which are important. And if you are using like a very bright three or four with a very good sectioning uh, technique, which is usually more like turf or oblique illumination on the, on the at least in the most used uh, illumination uh, techniques. And then you can end with ac accuracy, which are below 10 nanometers, which in this case allow you to access, you know, uh, to, 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 
visualize biological structure with tenfold uh, better resolution. In practice, uh, also the fantastic uh, uh, ability of this technique does, doesn't require much. Uh, what it requires, of course, is a good localization uh, technique, but now we have like plethora of techniques uh, which are all uh, very, very good uh, in localizing single fluor four for a large collection of, of data. Then you have several labeling strategies, which also now have like a lot, lot of expertise. And then they are being okay, packaged in different families. We can call palm or storm or paint. It just change a little bit in, in how you, you get this on and off uh, capability. But basically, it's either by converting a fluor four from one state to another one by switching a few of four to its right to a fluorescent to a non fluorescent state, or so interesting technique, which I will uh, talk about uh, because it's perfect uh, use, at least in our, in our hand, is the pain family, which rely more on the uh, transient labeling of, uh, of a few of four to its target. Okay, this is how you go from fluorescent to non fluorescent uh, states. And then, of course, what you need, as told before, you need a very good optical sectioning because background is also a nightmare because now we're talking about single molecules. So if there's a background, then the signal to noise will, will, will drop down and then we lose in accuracy. So this is a term which is around here. The B background needs to be reduced. This is what initially this technique has been used a lot for membrane proteins, which are located at the very close proximity of the glass cover slip. And then in this case, we can use either turf or uh, uh, oblique illumination, which provide you, of course, the best uh, axial resolution. Okay, so, but now that was the initial project. How can we go a bit deeper? Why being restricted to the current glass cover sleeve, which of course restrict a lot the, the, uh, the range of application of this fantastic technique. And then we uh, came with this idea, develop the, the, the source beam, having this micro mirror, putting the, the cell inside, so no, they don't have to be adherent, okay, anymore. So we can have like first, they can be to the, to the glass cover sleep, but in case you don't need the source beam, but as soon as it's a bit like deeper or not attached to the glass cover sleep, then of course that with the source beam, that's the perfect combination. And then we like the GNA pain technique because in this case, uh, it has a lot of advantage for, the, of course, large amount of, uh, and the main property we like is that he, have, he has like almost infinite uh, labeling. Okay, so then you can collect for a very long time because you can imagine single molecule, there's a big trade-off with time. Time will be, let's say the limit of the, here are the limit of the single molecule uh, technique. But now if we're talking about 3D sectioning, then the more section, the more time. So you need uh, to have access to label. You don't want to struggle with the buffers. You now, if we relate that to, to the storm, and uh, of course, compared to, to Palm, we can use organic fluor 4, which are much uh, brighter, then this is where we can get the, the best uh, accuracy and the best resolution at the end. And of course, DNA paints, uh, even more than other technique, they create a lot of background because you have your imager all around floating into the solution. They diffuse very rapidly. You don't see them as a single billion molecule until they dog to their target, but otherwise they create a huge amount of background. So this is why you need to have the good sectioning. This is why we create a very tiny light sheet here, about one micron to two micrometer at the big maximum, which means that all the fluor four which are around, which are not attached to the target or not in the field of view, then we don't see too much. Okay, so these were the first uh, data that we collected. Uh, say it was at the Mifobio school, actually. So we did very, pretty simply, we did like two colors, super resolutions, cislamine and uh, Golgi uh, protein. Could make sectioning. Uh, it works very, uh, very nicely. Uh, and we thought, okay, we are there, we can we can move forward. But then we realized that in this case, you need 2D localization. So 2D localization, when you have light sheet, which is about one micrometer thick or a bit more, it means that you may have like 20 to 50 nanometer resolution lateral, but only okay, more than 500 uh, nanometer axial. And in this case, depending on how your structure is organized, is definitely not, not enough to have this big discrepancy between 2D and 3D. So we had to go to 3D and this is what we did. 
So okay, that would be quite simple. Let's put like a stigmatism lens, which is the most let's say, straightforward uh, way to get uh, to get three D. Do not complexify too much your 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 system. So the idea you put astigmatism here, and then you will shape your Poisson function in a non symmetric way. So one uh, in one other focus part. It will be elongated in one direction, and then uh, below the focus, for example, it can be vertical and, and, and horizontal in the other direction. It's how, by doing some Gaussian fitting and other uh, analysis of your post perfection, you are capable to retrieve the axial coordinates. So very simple concept, really like it. However, when you start to go through deep with this high numerical aperture, they come with aberration, spherical aberration uh, mostly, and the spherical aberration, they will, they will kill uh, your capability to get good astigmatism. Okay, and this is what you can see here. This is a tree sectioning over one to two microns, and you can see that the astigmatism expected. So, okay, it will be like uh, corrupted by other uh, aberrations, and this is why we just plug. We have this little collaboration uh, with uh, Imaging G Company. We plug this uh, deformable mirror to correct for uh, aberrations, and then in this case. Just the main aberration of the sample aberration, which are very limited in case of single cell. And in this case, we can now put some pure astigmatism. Let's complexify a little bit the, uh, of course, the instrument because you need to have these adaptive optics into the, the system. But at the end, you can get this very nice 3D discrimination of single molecules. And now it is. So just collecting like a series, uh, like just like uh, 50 million. After the cover step, you can see that we have this very nice DNA paint sequence where we can discriminate with very limited background, single uh, molecule events with nice vertical and horizontal uh, PSF, which after analysis can give you this very nice topology of the cell. This is the lamin here. This is a single plane and you can see we can get this nice 3D topology of the, of the cell. And you can change the focus, make another one and so on and so forth. And you say, okay, wow, that works, that's cool. Uh, uh, and uh, here we are. Uh, we, that's almost true, I must say, because then come another limit, which I didn't talk about, uh, uh, about the, the source beam geometry, which is the, position of the, this mirror provide you with an issue with the drift. If you look now at this geometry here, so you can see that you have the, the mirror and the mirror exactly where it is reflected will give you the, put the axial position of your light sheet. So what happened now is that if your sample drift in the lateral direction here, then the light sheet will just be translated now in the uh, axially. But of course, your, uh, your objective focal plane would be at the same place, which means in this case, you don't have any more an alignment between the excitation beam and the imaging plane. And as, that's the main issue. So usually in traditional microscope, you just need to correct for the axial drift, which is very important, of course, in single molecule. Uh, this can be done optically, but of course, in our case, because we need to correct also for lateral drift, and then we have like another uh, big issue is that this is much harder to, to, to correct because axial, we can play with a laser and look at the reflection between your, your glass cover sheet and your sample, change your reflective index, you measure that, and then you correct, you can correct that in real time. But in X and Y, there is no real uh, solution right now. More especially because we also cannot put fiduciary into the cover sheet because now we are deeper into the sample, so there is no access. And then this is how I say, okay, let's use the fact that now we have this, this little micro wells, we have a polymer around which protect the mirror, so let's use them and we embed fiduciary markers and then we use these markers as a fiduciaries to correct. And then we have developed a software which called ZTrack, which allow you to to grab the data while they acquire in real time and then have a feedback loop on the uh, from the, the position of the fiduciary to the nano uh, the nano stage which is xyz and then we can correct in 3d directly from the image so this is uh, the result uh, out of that so it works very well so this is if you have zero correction so this is a drift uh, this is a, a 
lateral axial drift, whatever that we can measure. So with a correction, we can see that we have, you can have like a drift of your sample in X, Y, Z, very quickly outside of the, the, uh, of the thickness of your light sheets. Okay, but after correction, here even a correction uh, comparison with uh, a perfect focus system can do a physical correction uh, by reflection can do with the Z-track, knowing that the Z-track is a low, so which kind of like the same type of performance, but it's not only Z, it's also X, Y, and Z. Just a bit of summary. So now we just are able to correct the, 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 the any drift with an accuracy below uh, 15 nanometers, which means in our case, that which largely enough that we maintain the light sheets at the position of the focal plane. And of course, any remaining drift can be corrected offline like any traditional single location microscopy. <coughs> and then here we are for the first time, we're able to collect the, the, the entire cell uh, uh, let's say automatically. We also use the, the fiduciary to, to be able to realign the cells. I can tell you is not uh, it's not that easy, or at least less easy than we thought initially. And here, this is like a full reconstruction of an entire cell, a jocat cell with the PD1 receptor at the top of it. So 35 planes, about uh, 300 nanometer apart. The uh, limit being, of course, the total acquisition time, because one of the limit of traditional DNA pain technique is really that the exposure time needs to match the binding and unbinding rate. And in our case is 200 say, millisecond per frame. So multiply several tens of thousands of frame by the number of planes, then you end with an equi total acquisition time, which can, uh, which can be uh, 10 hours and plus for a single cell. Uh, which is a good tool of force in the sense that our system is able to be as precise as, as needed to do that. But of course, now we are working, trying to improve the overall system to make it faster. So we know the same is stable, but now if we want to produce biology from that, it can take some time. But however, we have this capability and we're really happy with that. And now we can really have access to the entire distribution of the receptor at the cell surface. So the next step uh, is, uh, of course, the analysis of that. And it's the work of uh, Florian in the, in the team, which is really the developers for those uh, maybe a follow, develop several software package, which are being used a lot by the community, more especially uh, a certain seller, of course, a color seller, which were published in, 15, uh, in 2015, 2019. But now that we have this 3D, Okay, distribution of, of molecules. Of course, we started to, to, to reach a limit of the, of the software that uh, the way they were developed before, you know, remember something very flat close to the curve of sleep, even if they are 3D, it's still like limiting in 3D. Now we're talking about coordinates, really isotropic, big samples, millions of uh, localization possibly, and then his work, he has worked on a very a new software, which he just released. So all the software are freely available and then it's called POCA for point cloud analyst. And this software is uh, now available and is capable to handle, he has a completely new engine, open gene engine, very robust. He can now handle like uh, creating Voronoise and 3D reconstruction in just like nothing amount of time, super fluent. And it comes with everything that we uh, developed uh, um, some years ago, meaning the capability to extract the clusters from the 3D point cloud, have the, all the statistics of every single clusters, having access to, to them and uh, get the, 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 okay, the, so the, the, the shape of the clusters. But also another point which is very interesting is not uh, so how these clusters now are distributed because now we have the whole cell and it's not about characterizing the cluster themselves which is usually what we do but now it's so okay where are these clusters organized at the cell um, at the whole cell uh, level whether there are polarity and of course thinking about like making contact with, with different cells which is something that we can now access with the with the source beam, you know, in the, to, uh, to 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 look deeper into the, the sample, and now uh, looking at the topology of the clusters, 
And also looking at very cool thing is using what we do in 2D for localization analysis to do the, now the cluster analysis and look at their distribution. This is another feature. It's very nice because this is like multi-scale but using the exact same number of, of tools that we have used for single molecule localization. Okay, so we have this very uh, nice uh, now. Uh, so this is under development, but the software now is already released uh, uh, as, uh, as okay, the publicly available. He has a lot of cool features I have time to, to go through. Okay, so now I'm done with this uh, single molecule. I will change the size, okay, and try to make you a parallel and now show you our new, uh, okay, object of interest is how can we, how we have uh, used sustenance technology now to look at 3D cell cultures, organoids, which are uh, in vitro system mimicking organs. Very exciting, very new in our hands, but we have like very good collaborators, but you will see that technology speaking this is a very nice, okay, we change completely the, uh, the dimensions. Okay, like for uh, by an order of magnitude very easily, but you can see this strong analogy between these two images, which I really like even through we are, we're looking at a single cell before. Okay, now you can see that the tool are very, can be very quickly, very similar, not looking at clusters, but looking at organization of cells in 3D. And this is usually the kind of readout you want from this uh, technology to understand, for example, okay, how a drug will affect the morphology of, uh, of, uh, of a 3D culture or an organoid. Okay, so what was the change to go to, from single cell to the uh, 3D culture? A new device and then there was a new device uh, developed by our friends in, in Singapore uh, okay that's the, the, the guy here Virgil Gianluca which is the master was developing this these uh, devices and Anne which was a former postdoc in my group which is now uh, working in Singapore and they, are, they came with this very nice idea to create this what we call the GOL which is the pyramidal shape uh, that hosts the the three culture, okay? So we're not talking about just a well, like it should be four square well into your, your, in which your sample fits. Now we have this 3D is a truncated pyramid in which cell can grow until it creates a 3D structure. And by creation contains four 45 degree mirror around that can be used straight away for imaging. So now you have an all-in-one system that allow you to culture your system or host your 3D system with dimension which can vary from few tens of uh, micrometer opening to much bigger. And then your system is inside and they, without any further manipulation, you can sign your beam and do source beam as I show you for single cell. The other very great advantage is that we do not, of course, have a single of this one, but we have an array of these uh, of these GWELs, so we call this GWEL array, and this GWEL array to give you an order of magnitude in a four millimeter by four millimeter, we already have like 150 organoids which are perfectly aligned and very all similar uh, GWEL, same distance and everything, which of course make this technology very suited for high content imaging, which is something not trivial to do with classical spin technology. So we have this Petri dish that contains hundreds to thousands of micro wells ready to host a thing. And then this is typically what you can do. You can do any kind of imaging. Here, this is a true bright field imaging where you can see all the organoids uh, uh, arrayed into, into each individual pyramid. If you zoom a little bit, you can see there in, in, in transmission. And then here you turn to, to, to the source beam and then you can get this natural sectioning of your, uh, of your sample, three sample here. So this is a, a, it's a three culture which has been, which has been uh, done from uh, IPS and then has been grown outside of the G1, which was our first uh, object of interest. And now we grow things inside. Because that's uh, the, 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 the full one of main interest is also the reproducibility system for seeding. Okay, you can start from initial condition going from one to uh, okay, a number, pretty homogeneous uh, aggregate of, of cells. 
that will self-organize okay, and grow the system where uh, cells divide and then they will create your, your structure of interest. And then you get 100 to 1,000 of these well, which provide you large statistics, even through there is some viability, and, but you can monitor the, the, uh, the condition because the system is ready to image. You really have like glass cover sleep. You can do high resolution imaging. Even already by uh, transmission light, you can guess your initial condition and maybe select the one which are very similar because I know that in the field, people are very interested in, in the, the, the reproducibility of the initial condition because, okay, whether you want, that, that's the, something that we discover. And even here, there's a little, kind of some, uh, little variability on the process to grow, but the statistics that we can get allow you to really pick the similar uh, initial condition, maybe to, to make already some phenotypic to see how they develop depending on the initial condition. Then the culture, they get trapped and then they form. And you know, like the peer in the bottle at the end, you rinse and then the organoid will trap because of the shape. Okay, and then now we, uh, for the sake of the, the demonstration, show that it is completely biocompatible and we demonstrated that we can grow several types of organoids or 3D culture, uh, uh, which are okay, up to 500, let's say, uh, microns, uh, which is the perfect size for the sustain technology. So this is on the smallest uh, 3D culture, these hepato-organoids grown from primary uh, rat hepatocytes. And then here's some oconspheres for uh, uh, cancer uh, 3D uh, culture here, uh, which will be bigger. The top opening of the is 120 microns here. Same as I show uh, initially. So these are uh, 3D pre-encapsulated cysts, which are grown from the tree frog technology. And then we put into the system after. So it's not grown inside, but you can big opening. Then they put them inside and you can imagine them. Here and another example that you don't even have to, you can also use different uh, uh, type of, of chambers if you are interested in so long uh, a structure like this intestinal gallery. Uh, here you, you use the, this type of chamber. So, and then you still see that always have this micro mirror that need to be at the proximity and in the field of view to be able to create the latch. This is another limit, but still works. Okay, so now in a practical uh, way, so that's the work of uh, Tom in the, in the group, so PhD students. So now we had to, to div we decided to develop an entire automatic acquisition for high content screening. So it's very simple as you can see. So you take a bright field, you just screen the whole um, the whole field of view automatically, and then you can detect automatically from the bright field, which is of course non non-invasive, de detect the micro wells with classical image analysis. Select the one you are interested in, whether they contain or not the organoids, depending on, on, uh, on what your, your uh, initial condition or whatever uh, thing you can filter out. You can automatically collect data. Again, another limit is drift, remember? So it's not maybe not a drift, but now we're talking about days of acquisition, okay? Eye content screening, which, which we follow in live, the, the evolution of, of organoids. And then it is same issue if we have here, as you can see here is, is shown here. If you now have any drift, it can be drift, also put error in the repositioning of your stage while it's collecting for days. Uh, uh, then, of course, you will lose the alignment with your light sheet and the, and the field of view. Even if we are not talking about thicker light sheets, okay, that will happen after, uh, after days of acquisition. So now we have another very simple way to correct uh, with the, the, the ideal resolution by simple cross correlation analysis. So we take a bright field image between two time points and then we just correct in real time the, the, the any translation. So the Z uh, no physically and the X, Y we, we correct by a simple cross correlation. It works very nicely and then we can collect for very long, long, uh, days of acquisition without uh, substantial 
issue into the quality of the image. So this was one of the first application we had. Okay, so these neuroectoderm organoids uh, grown from human uh, embryonic stem cells. Eight days of differentiation directly into the source beam uh, devices. And here, as a proof of concept, we could collect. So they were uh, fixed after that, stained, and we could collect uh, 100 organoids, about a bit less than 100 uh, micrometer thick, three colors in less than one hour, just to show you that it's very, very uh, fast and very straightforward with a very limited amount of manipulation from the users. That's automatic. There's no need to search from which, where the organoids are all aligned, all similar, and, and so on and so forth. So it's just to get like this, your statistics. <clears throat> and also it's, we get subcellular resolution, which is so like very interesting. You can combine with the best objective that you have. And then we can see that we can see subcellular detail for every single organoid. Dealing with the fact that light sheet is live gentle, so we could collect here for time lapse experiments. So this is the longest proof concept that we did. So this is uh, FG2 uh, GFP stable cell lines. Okay, where you can see the nuclei uh, uh, visible in GFP, and we could co collect like a 64 hours time lapse with 20 minutes. You know, that's a really huge uh, number, and then we could uh, monitor 20 positions for uh, several days, same type of volume. And we can see that, okay, cell, they continue to grow, they divide with the same rate and so on and so forth. Just to illustrate the fact that this is really gentle, high speed and gentle to, uh, to fluorescence and to, uh, to damage. <clears throat> so the next that we, are, uh, that we are now investigating is, okay, first time we are super happy to talk with people from the field and say, okay, look, what do you think about these instruments? Say, yeah, that's, wow, that's cool, but what do we do now, okay? We're talking about collecting terabyte of data and what I'm doing, I will not look at them and that, that's correct. And then of course, now the, the, the big limit of this technique, pushing the high content level, 3D live analysis. And that's really something that we are now, uh, we start to investigate in a couple of years. We have few students working, trying to implement a state of the art analysis for the 3D uh, system, which is not very obvious, but one of the field, of course, is uh, deep learning. And we are now trying to implement to the whole flow some uh, deep learning tools to be able now to at least segment the, the cells. This is what we expect that, okay, doing segmentation, getting the say, morphodynamic analysis of this would allow us later on to do uh, some uh, classification uh, and phenotypic analysis because that's what the technique is, we think is good at. And now we are capable to start to be able to now having some uh, pretty uh, good results to uh, extract cells, get their uh, lots of features about their size, about their position. And of course, now we can see the nice also uh, um, <clears throat> uh, analogy between what we've done, the work we do in single molecule and the work that we can now do at the uh, cellular level. But the tools, part of the tools are pretty nice. We can realize that there are a lot of tools that we have developed to try to quantify the molecular organization, now to quantify the cellular organization. But I think this is some readouts which are very interesting to get to do some phenotypic analysis. So these were a few examples, different bigger uh, 3D structures. So using different type of network to extract, for example, where are the mitosis, where are the cell depth, which are the typical readouts interesting to uh, to, to see, first of all, drug response, okay? So if I put a drug on a different concentration, I have the capability to collect the data and how it affects, okay, uh, size of uh, the, the nuclei morphology, but also the capability of the, the system to, to, to divide in a place to, to death and so on, and to make this, this 3D structure. That's really what we are investigating now, and it's getting very interesting uh, progress to that. And I uh, think we are close to be able to put that in the whole pipeline. 
some tip of stats that we can extract. We can pull all the data, localize where these events in the whole 3D uh, system. And finally, that's another point. So now coming back more to the imaging side, uh, which is a bit more our uh, expertise, uh, of course, is uh, something that took some time to develop because it was not a priority is, OK, Lightsheet is known to create some okay, shadowing effects. And also the fact that you are if you are now to optimize the image and then you see that, for example, you shine from one side, you can see that you can tune your system to have something sharp in one side, but however, it will be more blurry on the other side. So it's always a compromise when you shine with a Gaussian beam. And more especially, you will also have some, uh, some uh, you can have some shadowing effect, which you can see like some dark line. We don't see here, but sometimes we have, depending on the, on the structure, which is more or less opaque. And you can see at the distribution of density, of course, this is more sharper here than here. This is expected. So what's done usually is that you use several objectives, which is uh, in classical geometry requires this type of very complex system, several objectives, one to shine from one side, collect from the other one, and so on and so forth. And here you can guess that by uh, the, the, the the geometry of the G will allow us to do that very straightforward manner. Just have like four sides. We just want the system is aligned. We can shine from top, left, right, so on and so forth. Use like classical sigmoid and then we fuse that. And the big advantage of that is that there is the, in terms of processing is very super fluent because there is no need to register the sample because when you shine from one objective to another one and you, you change which one is, is illuminating, which one is looking at, then you see the, 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 the plane of imaging are not the same. So in your case, it's much easier because the camera do not move, the sample do not move, and then just changing the light sheet and then exciting from the different side. Now we have more isotropic system in 3D and compatible, of course, with the, the high content screen. Okay, so that's again another thing is okay, a bit uh, ongoing. And with this, I think, I don't know what time, so it must be close to the end. I'd like to thank you. And also, of course, thank all the people that have worked on that. So it's not really up to date uh, picture of the group. There are a lot of change, but as I so mentioned, the collaborators, key people, and more especially, I forgot to mention at the beginning was Remy, the team, which really, was postdoc, came as a postdoc in the team to develop the first source team uh, more than 10 years ago. And he's now PI in the group. He's really like one of the, the main developer of the, of the technique. Florian already uh, presented him, Tom. And a lot of new uh, people now working in the application. We have new uh, collaboration with, with the technology like uh, Isan here, for example. And, uh, yeah. and thank you. I'm ready to hear for any questions. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, uh, um, excellent talk. So Nick will now do the quiz and the question answers. And till then, like, please post your questions in the chat window. Even better if you want to ask yourself. And yeah, over to you, Nick. Right, yeah, thanks for a really interesting talk. So um, yeah, if you, all right. I can now screen. <laughs> Just to remind you, the quicker you answer, the more chance you've got of winning our, our amazing fold scope. Right, here we go. Well, we've got a few people in already. Uh, uh, we've got five, five, six. Let's give it a few more minutes, see if another couple of people can join us. Um, great fold scope and <laughs> illumination from another angle. <laughs> I have to say, I do really like the um, the uh, multi-view aspect of it. That, that is pretty cool. Thanks. Let's see if anybody else is going to join. Anyone else out there? There's quite a few people on the in the session today. Oh yeah, we got, okay, we've got seven people. That's probably enough to get started. So here we go. Fingers on the buttons. All right. Oh, no, come on. What has gone on? You should be on the first question here. All right. 
Nick, you want to refresh or something? Or maybe... yeah, I'm just going to go out and in again because uh, it's honestly not there. <laughs> Hang on a moment. The curse of Mentimeter. Right, I'll try again. All right. Talks. <clears throat> All right. I can't actually even reload it now, Curti. It, uh, you know, obviously having the having sat there with people signing up to it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's unfortunate. Uh, Let me have another go. Maybe we can take a couple of questions. So one of the questions on Bhaptis is like, uh, where do the streaking artifacts come from? From Dushan. Dushan, if you want to unmute and ask the question and have a discussion, please do so. If you're still around, I'm not sure if you are. I can see actually you in the Dushan. Okay, nonetheless, yeah, his question is where do the streaking artifacts come from? Ah, okay. Uh, streaking artifact, what is the, the, the lines or what, what streaking artifacts? Mm. Yeah, uh, he has to clarify that himself what exactly he means by streaking. Okay. Is this the, sh the shadowing that sometimes we, we see that uh, there are a bit of uh, sometimes some light which are dimmer and brighter, which are the, the yeah, I think the shadowing <coughs> artifact which are classical to, to spin that we can see from time to time. I don't know if it's talking about another. Yes. Right. Okay. Oh, exactly. So I think that's really, I don't know the exact. Okay, if, if this is just like some the, the fight that when you go through the sample from the side and the light may slightly deviate or whatever, it's known that when you do that and you look for from below, then it creates some dark uh, some dark uh, lines uh, due to some dense structure, which have some refractive index that that kind of deviate the, the light, and then you have from time to time some lights that we do not go through uh, homogeneously and then create this, this okay, black and white uh, light. And this is why you usually shine when you have the capability from different sides to, and then uh, not of rage, but use the use an algorithm, fusion algorithms to be able to have the left imaging from the front and the right imaging. So that's the, that's the point how to correct that. Yeah. His question was exactly that, and I guess Nick has fixed the maintenance. I've, I've gone back in and out of the ceiling. There we go. Yeah. Coming and responding this time. No? All right. Yeah. We have players, so uh, let's go for the first question. The faster you get, the more points you get. What is the significance of SO spin, SO spin? And answer quickly. So-called spin, single objective spin, or solo spin. And it stands for single objective spin. All right, we've got six players in. Right, excellent. So let's see how we're doing on stone. Right, Puggy, the Hustler, Frosty, Bran the Broken, Zippy and CVS. And <coughs> winner so far, right? But um, actually, everyone's pretty much on your tail. So get on the buttons quickly. 
Compared to conventional SPIM techniques, why is SOSPIM efficient for single molecule localization microscopy? Is it good optional sectioning, the use of high and high objectives, or the use of a single objective for both excitation and detection? And the answer is uh, high NA objectives is a real key for SML. Right. Let's see how we're doing. There's a leaderboard going. Oh, we've got another player here, Mr. Micro as well. <laughs> right, Puggy, you are hanging on to your lead by <laughs> about 60 points. Right. The hustler and zippy on your tail. Here we go. Question number three. Why are lateral drifts specifically an issue in the SOSPIM architecture? They induce light sheet drifts, they induce focal plane drifts, or I can't spell, or they induce sample drifts. And the answer is bang. They induce light sheet drifts. Right. Let's see what we're doing now. Ooh, Brand the Broken, no, the Hustler, maybe. Ooh, I think we have a new leader. There we go. <laughs> the Hustler is now on in contention with Zippy on the tail. So let's see, let's see who we get next. Question number four. Oh. What is the main interest of the dual array for imaging in 3D cell culture? The pyramidal shapes of the well, their compatibility with bright field and fluorescence imaging, or parallelization of culture and imaging? And the answer is parallelization. There we go. Even though they are indeed trying to let's see where we are with oh, maybe the lead, leaderboard is changing again. CVS got this one. Puggy might be back in. Oh, oh yeah. Ah, oh, back on top again. <laughs> well done. <laughs> it's very, very close now. It's all on the last question. So let's see how we go. A quick answer will get you the prize. What is the main advantage of the jewels for multi-view imaging? Precise control of the beam waste, no need for image registration or the automatic image registration. And the answer is no need for image registration. That's built into the device. So, a bit of a drum roll. Let's see who's going to be the winner this week. Oh, oh, oh. I think it's going to be Puggy. Yeah, <laughs> Puggy, if you could uh, put your uh, contact details in or contact the, uh, the RMS in the chat, you'll get the fold scope winging its way to you. And thank you very much for everyone for competing. And for that, <laughs> I will stop. Sharing. Okay. Very good answers. I love that quiz. All right. Are you still there? Our Curtis is on me. So I think we should carry on asking some questions. Did we get any more questions in the um, in the chat while we were doing the quiz? Apart from Greek talk, I have some quick look here. Oh. Does anyone put their oh Curtis, you're back there? Does anyone do you want to take over again? Yeah, there are only a couple of minutes left, so almost uh, perfect timing. Uh, I actually, I have a, do have a question. If we, if we go ahead. yeah. So, um, if you're doing long term uh, three long term imaging on the jewels array, how is the change? Does the change in the media or sort of refreshing media on that platform have any issue on sort of keeping it focused, or does your sort of tr your Z tracking mechanism just automatically correct if, you, if the user is disturbing it? Uh, I think you can really maintain, so this is what we've done, you can really maintain the fluid or whatever, and these do not change the, the, the capability of the system. 
for uh, for imaging. So it is very important, typically, for this culture that they are really you know they they, they have the nutrients yeah. uh, to to grow for uh, yeah, for uh, time of experiments. And also, what's cool is that you can really put them on a microscope, put them back on the incubator for doing something, put them back again, and because this is a matrix. So you can really turn them, uh, find them again, and, and image them uh, again. So that's also another very interesting thing. So you can either do that on a microscope or outside of the microscope, put them back again. So that's so very uh, simple. And optically speaking, yeah, the stabilization is is good enough uh, to to retrieve the the position, and uh, there is no no, no big deal. So that's no, okay. Um, any other question? I had another one on the um, for the storm. You need you know you typically uh, if you're doing blinking in a buffer. You would did you ever do you ever do that on this instrument? I think you talked about the photo switchable proteins, which will operate in a different parameter space. Do you ever do storm on this system, or is that not possible? Yes, yes, we have a D-storm. In fact, we've done in the, in the first paper, what we have done is, is D-storm. Actually, we realize that, you know, maintaining with the buffer, you know, if you have this open chamber and the maintaining the buffer with the good concentration of everything that is required to have the blinking long term was not nor and the most you know, simple to handle the, the blink, more especially in 3D. Also, when you are in light sheets, Maintaining the single molecule regime means that because you just excite wild plane and the one which are above and below, they're not maintaining the triple state. So it means that overall the acquisition for 3D is not the most straightforward. We, right. you know, we should change a little bit the, the thing. And uh, so Palm works, of course, okay, it doesn't activate, but it's less bright. So when you start to go deeper, you lose a bit of photons. The, so that's nice, but uh, just limited in terms of photon. The D storm, I must say, is between keeping the blinking for long term and maintaining the, the triplet state in the light sheet uh, mode is something that we found not very, very uh, 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 Why? And then also, you know, finding the good regime for being a single molecule is, uh, yeah, a bit more complex. Why it is so much easier with DNA pain. This is why. We Be but is less is less be thank you. Gotcha. Thanks a lot. Yeah, so this is the offer. We, we don't have anything for us. We are planning some souvenirs for a while now. Let's see when that. <laughs> so next time you invite me again and then. You in person sometime around the scene. Have an applause for a great talk. That was really interesting. So much for giving me come along. In one world this week. Oh, yeah. Bye. Bye bye.